So take the time to just see each other a little bit. It's a taking refuge in connection of the Sangha with the Sangha, so important. In the last pandemic, I don't think anyone had anything like this to stay connected. We're very lucky. Especially in the winter. <laughs> okay, let's get started doing nothing. Hmm. So as you come to get settled into your seated posture and letting the eyes come to close, and starting to just reacquaint with these dimensions of our sense experience that we're not always so attuned to. In the body, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. And of course, the many flavors of the mind, heart. And that just like any other sense store, reveal themselves freshly in each moment. coming to understand and explore this wide range of mental, emotional experience. A fundamental part of our practice. Just knowing what is arisen? Without any agenda, aware of our preferences. But powerfully interested. So fundamentally important orientation of our Vipassana practice. So we notice restlessness or sleepiness, clarity, fogginess, anxiety, joy, calm, anger, sadness. On their own terms. And 
And yet it's also understood that there is a value in cultivating certain qualities of heart, mind over time. Deepening our understanding of them. As we build more robust channels to connect with them over time and in different conditions. So it can be helpful just seated here with things as they are in the body and mind. to notice if there's any aspect of the heart experience that might feel more tender, more comforting, warmer, more kind. Sometimes we can find even a little thread of some kind of tenderness. No matter what is happening in the body, the other channels of the mind. And so it's always worth exploring, seeing if there is any sense of tenderness, of care, kindness that's available in the heart, mind. And then feeling what it feels like to receive that. to attune to that. To tend to the embers of any gentleness. That we encounter. Is there a relief in the heart itself? softening in the mind, softening in the body. So often the practices of loving kindness and the other Brahma Viharas are treated with a lot of method and conceptual strategies. Those can be very helpful tools. But sometimes it can feel just simpler if we have any sense of access to this quality of tenderness, to simply attune to it. Feel the simple goodness of anything that might feel like it's in the realm of kindness that's available in the heart and mind. And abide in it for as long as it lasts.
This tenderness of heart doesn't need an object. They don't need to send metta. They don't need to find a being right now that feels worthy within ourselves or outside ourselves. Sometimes we can simply attune to care. This caring quality. Let the goodness, the simplicity, the refreshing quality of it nourish the heart itself, the mind, the body. And find our way back when we lose the thread. Sometimes it's not readily available. We can go to practicing our mindfulness practice. Or we can use one of the tools we may have learned to bring to mind someone that naturally calls up our sense of care. But if we find that wave again, that groove in the heart, that quality of tenderness, just trusting that we can let go of the concept of the conjuring. And at times simply settle in to this tender quality. Nourish ourselves on the goodness of it. And over time, perhaps noticing the sense of it radiating outward. being shared. But not worrying about a project or an agenda. And just finding our connection to this caring quality. Wandering off and finding our way back feeling the goodness, the nurturing, beautiful and supportive qualities that it builds in the heart, mind, body.
Michelle, you're you're still muted there. Okay. Perhaps I'm not muted anymore. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. John Muir was a great uh, geologist and mountaineer ecologist. Uh, he said once, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it is hitched to everything else in the universe. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it is hitched to everything else in the universe. And I, I wanted to say that um, the Sunday sits that we have together feel a bit like that to me. I think that when we um, first went into the pandemic, um, I would never have imagined um, the significance and power of taking refuge with each other in this way. You know, after some time now, I, I really have to um, say and express my deep gratitude to all of you because we are all hitched together in the universe. And um, I think the challenges for a lot of people, maybe not everyone here at this um, sitting, the challenge of um, keeping our spiritual practice in alignment with um, not just the pandemic, but the, all the issues that have become more glaring this year. You know, just to take in that when we ask you to take time to just have eye contact, how, how meaningful and important it is. So I, I, I'm, um, I, I read a bit about the pandemic that happened about a hundred years ago and um, get a sense of how isolating that must have been for so many people and that we do have the good fortune of being able to be with each other in this way. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's definitely, um, it's, it reminds me of in Hawaii when you weave a lei and um, weave, weave the flowers together and that it feels like every Sunday we, we weave our lei of flowers together, you know, and it, as Steve says, it's like a quilt of faces, how, how much gratitude I feel for that. And I think humor, humor has a um, very important part in terms of staying afloat with some joy um, in a year like this. So I just wanted to share a little uh, haiku by Kobayashi Isa, uh, the great Japanese um, poet who had one of the more difficult lives I've ever uh, read about. He said, a fruitful year Flies gather on the grass, singing happily. You know, do you feel like that at the end of this year? A fruitful year, flies gather on the grass, singing happily. You know, the encouragement is to find the flies, right, singing. So again, you know, the other day I was walking up my driveway in the dark, uh, and it was so dark, I finally turned the uh, flashlight on. And there were just two bufos in Hawaii, they're these big toads, but two bufos just sitting next to each other, hanging out. Um, it, it's like that world I don't see often. Um, and I wondered, well, are they just, do they just happen to be <laughs> sitting next to each other? Like, 
you know, just randomly and just for a few seconds or do they hang out, you know? So I backed off and waited, came back. They were there, you know, went inside, came back out. They were there. And it's just like, I think there's a, there's a ways in which in our lives, I think particularly this time of year uh, where it's important to uh, remember to tune into the lives of other beings as well as our human beings, even if it's lies. The Vipassana, uh, the definition of Vipassana is seeing, seeing into the nature of how things are, Na nature, the nature of how things are, um, finding a as Jesse was saying, a tender, tender exploration of that, a tender awareness with our relationship with whatever appears um, means that we value the truth. And in this time where the truth tends to be a very uh, fragile, a thing in and of itself, uh, those of us who value truth, I think, um, find it important to dig even deeper into it. Maybe just as a healthy response to um, making sure we're holding up our end of valuing the truth. And we, we come to understand that the truth is that every moment is new, that nothing lasts for a second, and that we cannot control reality. We cannot control the nature of how things are. And that when anything appears, sound, sight, smells, taste, touch, thought, emotion, when anything appears, it appears first non-conceptually. And it's only because we're not paying attention that we, we will think that maybe um, life sometimes appears conceptually, but it doesn't. Even a thought doesn't appear conceptually at first. Uh, nothing does. That's the truth of how things are. And it, it's, we've been mentioning this, but it's that need for a certain kind of stability The training is such for humans to value conceptual thought, which is based on the past, rather than the um, visceral, innate, moment-to-moment, -moment, non-conceptual truth as it's unfolding, reality as it's unfolding. So, you know, that in the... Uh, Mahayana tradition that the sense of describing the truth is like the, the appearance is like a phantom or a dream that, that the Buddha said that like appearing like a bubble in a stream, that's how fast it is, right? If anyone has noticed um, the Geminids, the meteor showers of this month, if you just see one, you see that you can't even turn your head a little bit to the right or left and, and see one that somebody says, did you see that, right? You can't because it's gone. It's that fast. And it, I think that the shooting stars are such a great example or the, the Buddha, the flash of lightning, that, that sense that that's how fast things are moving. You can't grasp it conceptually, really. We try to make it conceptual. I can say winter, I can say darkness, I can say shooting star, but that never describes it, right? It can't possibly, the conceptual world, it, it helps us um, aim toward, it helps us aim our awareness toward an experience that is actually indecipherable. So we're only seeing 
the fleeting images of thoughts when we try to decipher it. It's like a thought about an experience like uh, winter, for example, um, or my foot or uh, fear or anything. It's just like it, it's, it's the, the practice is meant to help us switch our whole relationship to experience so that the words help us drop into the non-conceptual experience. We're not rejecting words. We're not trying to make a war or a struggle with conceptual thought in any way. We use it. We keep using it skillfully. They're, they're like good friends. And so we, we, we come to understand by paying attention in this way that, that anything that, that appears has no solid self-essence because it's so fleeting and you can't control them. Uh, and I, I think that, that, that as you start to have these um, insights, understandings about the nature of how things are, there's, there's more and more courage courage and willingness to receive life as it's appearing non-conceptually without trying to understand it conceptually. So you, you're, there's a willingness to try to receive the breath or receive the sound or receive anger, receive a sight without trying to nail it down. You know, that the way we describe that is a, it's just being with, it's a quiet abiding with. There's often that tenderness Jesse's describing or kindness as well at times. Uh, a relationship of quiet abiding with things as they are. Again, without trying to force any kind of understanding conceptually we're trying to figure it out conceptually. This leads to a kind of deeper and deeper quiet and stillness. And that the, the kind of timeless world, the life, the aliveness and freshness of the timeless world, no past, no future it becomes more digestible. There's less need to get rid of how we're perceiving reality or to get something out of how we're perceiving reality. And this is, this is such a relief. It's like the contentment that can come. It's not, um, It's not something we can make happen as we know, but you, you can just quietly go along um, and there, by a kind of grace, this contentment appears through, through mostly the acceptance of how things are. And including the acceptance of resistance if you if you're tired, the acceptance of the tiredness. If you're restless, the acceptance of the tiredness. If you're if there's doubt, not trying to talk yourself out of the doubt, there's an acceptance. Oh, doubt. Ha ha ha. My good friend doubt, right? There's oh, ha ha ha. My good friend anxiety. Ha 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 ha. Whatever. It's like ha 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 ha. Wow, tiredness. You know, we can get tired. You know, this time of year, I think people forget that. It's usually a low energy time. It's not like the June solstice, right? It's we're careening into the December solstice. And it, it's a time where ironically, I think that um, human beings in the Northern hem hemisphere tend to speed up. Whereas naturally it would be more natural <laughs> to, to slow down, you know. Uh, 
I don't know if you've um, been reading about the or seeing the um, the two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, are getting closer and closer together. The last month, and um, on the solstice, they're supposed to be um, this great conjunction. It's like they're supposed to be. I don't even know what it means, but they're supposed to be 0 0.1 degrees apart. Um, but there are many people asking astronomers, what is it going to look like? You know, is it going to look like they're one great star together, or will they st still look apart? And this one astronomer um, said, um, there is not one human being on this planet that's ever seen anything like this before. So how can we answer that question? We don't know. And, and he said, well, it could be really fun to just see what happened. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's the practice with everything, right? Fear comes up instead of like the reaction, right? It's like, oh, maybe we could see what happens if we connect, right? with it, right? And it's like with everything, but I just love that idea that no one has seen this before. And um, maybe we could just watch it and <laughs> see what happens. Maybe it's going to be really cloudy, but you know, the next night it will be still very close, right? It's like I'm just watching it the last weeks. It's just amazing. I know I've never seen this before, you know, and it's quite exciting. Um, but this is, I'm saying, I'm telling this particular story because it's so significant for every moment. None of us have ever experienced the next moment before. No, no praying mantis or ant or cloud or nothing ever stays the same. There's never again this moment. And we, we just, um, have to develop a taste for this truth. So it's a it's amazing month and that December 14th tomorrow is the new moon, which is it's like very, very dark at the new moon in December. The solstice happens, you know, it's like um, and then what is our relationship to darkness itself, our relationship to light and darkness? And is there a sense of the sacredness of the dark, the holiness of the darkness? When I was about 22, I moved up from Massachusetts to Northern Maine um, with uh, my family and a few friends. And we lived without running water and electricity and way off the grid, three little children. Uh, and one of the first stories I remember someone told me about that area um, where that, what the story was that um, maybe, a hundred years before that, that was probably 19. <laughs> I was there in 1973 and on. Um, every month of the year, that year, there was a frost that killed the potato crop. It killed, this was the main crop up there in Northern Maine, the potato crop, but there were other crops, of course, but there was no backup. There were no trucks bringing oranges, right? It's like they had nothing to eat and many people died and many people left. And so in the area that I lived, which we were the only people in the town, but you could walk up this old road. It was uh, the first old road between Bangor, Bangor, Maine and Canada. Um, just a you could barely walk it, never mind drive it. But there were so many old cellar holes, you know, where there's just that, that the, the foundation empty and 
the, the few herbs that were still left, you could smell, you could smell the life of the people there. There was mint planted and tansy and pennyroyal and the herbs that, that were used for the cooking, all gone from a frost every winter, right? So our relationship to darkness and winter in the Northern hemisphere, um, once, once we got electricity is so skewed, right? It's like, we don't often have this appreciation for eight years I lived without electricity and just got a very different appreciation, Never mind running water, but the darkness was what really um, impressed me and my relationship particularly to the winter stars uh, because they became my friends. They were so important. The new moon was so important uh, in terms of um, the isolation and the beauty and the relationships I was able to cultivate with the stars from, from that darkness. And the people that I got to know, one, one woman in particular about far down the, far, far down the road, uh, her ethic was just to be neighborly. It had nothing to do with what you believed, what you looked like, what you did, who you were. It had to do with the ethic that being neighborly is just what you do. And um, I think that that ethic has, again, kind of um, the simplicity of it, uh, the kindness of it, it has nothing to do with who you are. It has to do with helping each other, right? And particularly helping each other through the darkness or particularly helping each other through a pandemic, et cetera. You know, it's just like um, the, the phrase, you know, good tidings, good tidings in the winter. To me, it's just, it doesn't matter again what the belief system is. It's a sense of, how do you hold up through the long winter in the Southern atmosphere? Of course, it would be the opposite timing, but it's the same idea that no matter where you live, there are times when it's difficult and more difficult or less difficult. When people would visit us in, in Northern Maine, um, they were all old friends that lived with electricity. And the first thing that would happen when they would come to visit is that they would fall asleep without the electric light. And they would really be upset. They would like, they'd stay for a few days and they would just get sleepier <laughs> and sleepier. And they'd wanna go to bed at like seven o'clock at night. Or, you know, they just didn't know what to do, right? You know, it's just like, what do you do? <laughs> We lost most of our friends that first year or two because no one could deal with it. Or people actually left because even to the town where they could get electricity, it was that deep. That's what I saw. There was that deep um, fear of what you do in the dark. And a couple of years later, I had the great opportunity to read a, a book about uh, Greenland. And what was such a revelation is that in, it was so frozen there in the winter and no roads between towns, you know, very different continent, yeah. And the winter were, was a lot of people's favorite times. And I remember thinking, wow, that's so different. And just reading on it, it's like the time where they could visit each other in any towns, there was no road. And so the time they could visit would be when everything was frozen, the ice, the snow, and they got along around by dog sled. So that winter was the happy time where you connected and not the um, hard time that you tried to get through. 
all, why? Because of connection. Being able to be with each other. The first year that I was without electricity in Northern Maine and all of us were living in one house, a very uh, experimental intense. Uh, and by November, you know, when it was getting dark by three o'clock in the afternoon, it started to turn into like Santa's workshop. Everybody started to make presents and crafts and um, it, it, I'm not knocking that it was, it was interesting, but it was like, again, that uh, inability to just be, to just sort of know what it would be like, even to go outside. It's like I built a, um, a tree house, a little tree house and slept outside that winter without heat. It was very cool um, because I wanted to just experience what it was like um, to really be quietly abide with the winter. I had a not such a good sleeping bag and I just had a little ladder that went into onto a platform. But I remember probably my favorite memory is that um, the red squirrels in the northern um, in the northern winter for, forest there are these red squirrels and they really liked my sleeping bag. And they thought it was theirs. And over the months of the winter, <laughs> when I would come out, I had a little lantern with a candle on it. And it was all these deep snow or ice. And I'd be kind of trudging out there. Uh, and they would actually throw things at me. They would throw little pine cones. And they really did not want me to occupy that space. And it was so much fun, really. It would be like I'd, I'd yell up and go, I'm coming. And they'd throw things at me. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm coming. And I developed, I'm trying to get across. It's like a relationship with these beings um, that we don't even pay attention to. Our friends, right? And out of that connection, whether it's with the stars or the bufos or a fish or a cat, right? It's like the purring of a cat or the barking of a dog. Whatever it is, it is uplifting and brings us energy. So we have the courage to get through another day, to want to live to not feel all isolated and unhitched, <laughs> unhitched from everything in the universe. And I think we can really get attached to the light or attached to the dark uh, on psychological levels and physical levels. Um, the dark of course, there's a, there's a lack of relationship with it because it can be dangerous, yeah? It's not all holy. Just like with the light, the dark can help us to actually appreciate the light, but the light can be just as dangerous. You see the people who won't eat because they don't wanna feel grounded, right? Or they'll practice spiritually in a way that they get so ungrounded, they get attached to joy and they don't wanna face pain. It's like there are many aspects to this, um, our relationship to food, our relationship to embodiment, our relationship to um, spirit, all from again, not exploring and um, I'm looking for a word <laughs> that isn't, um, I think it's a serious exploration of light and dark as they are actually the last to go before the unconditioned.
Kobayashi, Kobayashi Isa. His name means one cup of tea. I really relate to that. <laughs> Kobayashi Isa, Isa, one cup of tea. He was born in 1763 and uh, really had a hard life and, and uh, is very well known for his love of nature, animals, birds, children, uh, a lot of compassion. So I wanted to read of three haiku to end the talk. Ask tearfully, truly, even the flowers are falling, falling to the ground. That's what I mean by seriously. Ask tearfully, truly. The exploration can go deep if it comes out of that. Um, it doesn't have to be real tears, but come out of the, um, the grief of the fleetingness in relationship to the fleetingness of the world. And the second, snowy white dew above the potato fields, the river of heaven. The Milky Way is the river of heaven. Lastly, I think um, as we again shift into the um, end of the year on the relative level, um, Isa Kobayashi, Kobayashi Isa says at the beginning of this haiku, at the year's end, it is the Shinto custom to hang New Year prayer cards and wishes all around the shrine. And so this is his haiku. The blossoming plum, stoop-shouldered like an old man, loaded with wishes. And I hope that uh, somewhere either on your altar or in a little plant inside or something outside. I hope there's something loaded with beautiful wishes for your new year and uh, holiday time. Appreciating the light, the goodness of the light, the goodness of the darkness and practicing together so we get free. in these challenging times. <laughs> so if you have any questions about um, your practice, Jesse's instructions, the talk, On the way where we've been taking questions is through the um, just raising your blue hand, not your physical hand, but the your Zoom hand. Um, if you don't know where that is, if you click on the participants button at the bottom of your screen, on the right hand side it should show up a list of the participants, and then at the bottom there there should be a little button that has a little blue hand it says raise your hand, or it might be under the more button there. And if it's not working for some reason, you can type in a question to the chat if you like.
quiet abiding together is pretty nice. <laughs> There are no questions at this point. I might just say a few words about that approach to <clears throat> the metta practice. Um, you know, it's it's not going to feel natural to everyone. You know, many of us have been trained by repeating, you know, phrases that evoke the loving kindness feeling, or again, more conceptual pieces of you know bringing to mind people who might evoke those feelings and. Um, kind of jump-starting the sensations in the mind, heart, and um, and then sort of, you know, building up that connection over time through that sort of generative process. And those are, you know, wonderful ways to practice. Um, but I, I do think it's worth exploring for everyone, especially if, if it's something that sometimes maybe actually feels more natural to some people. Some people have a hard time with those methods, you know, of cultivating loving kindness or compassion, appreciative joy or equanimity. And to really know that, you know, the Buddha didn't teach them in a very conceptual way. They, they're they taught more just like that, just the kind of radiating outward um, of the Brahma Viharas. Sometimes breaking it down into, you know, this, this direction or that direction, um, all the beings or, you know, what have you. But but this idea of just a sort of tuning in to this quality of heart and letting that connection build and perhaps radiating it outwards is a totally um, worthwhile way of, of trying to practice and exploring the, the qualities. And it may or may not be hard, you know, harder to sort of feel like you get concentrated with it, but uh, many people feel like it's kind of a relief of a way to practice. Um, and I do encourage the kind of exploration of it, even if it feels sort of awkward at times. There's a question here from Vanessa. Hey there. I have a question. Great. When you brought up meta, it made me think about it. It's, it's it's an everyday sort of thing. But today, um, a couple of uh, days ago, my neighbors um, texted me and asked me to feed their fish because they were going away. So I was a little surprised. I because I, we're in I'm in Toronto. And we're in you know grey lockdown, which is even worse than red, and. Um, so I, I said, sure, I'll feed the fish. And where are you going during these COVID times? They live in Argentina. Or they're from Argentina, their families. So I thought perhaps they were going back to Argentina to see family members. And they said, no, their trip to Argentina had been canceled. And, um, and they were going, and, and she said, uh, you'll think we're nuts, but we're going to Florida. So, um, so I texted back and I said, um, of course, I would feed the fish, but my judgments just <laughs> went out of the roof because that's exactly what we're being asked not to do, <laughs> you know, not where we go, but just to, to, to stay home, you know. And um, and so I said, of course, I feed the fish and um, I envied them the sunshine. Um, and uh, but you're right. Yes, I think you're nuts. You know? <laughs> Anyway, so I, they went off and um, I went over today to feed the fish. And first of all, the, the coat that I had for the front door didn't work. But fortunately, I found the side door. Then I went into the kitchen and um, the fish food wasn't anywhere to be seen. And so I texted them and they didn't reply. So then I went, texted them again. And then I went to the, I was just about to walk in the door of the pet food store. And I'm trying not to go out shopping because I'm old and um, 
And they, she called me and told me exactly where it was. And she'd forgotten to put it out, and it was in some cover. Anyway, the details don't don't really matter. And but so much came up for me. My empathy for the fish who could die if it didn't get its food, and um, and the poor little thing was just you know every time I went anywhere near the fish bowl, it would go up to the top, you know, looking for the food. And my anger and, 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 and sort of disappointment that, that they were even traveling at this time. And, and, and yet, I, here I am wishing them a happy holiday. I mean, I felt so conflicted in all of my, that what came in and out of my brain because I, and I, and then of course I got into self judgment that Vanessa, it's not your life and you should just be, um, you know, anyway. How can you deal with that inside your head? Because there was just so much going on. I mean, I want them to have a good time. They're nice people. And we've got two little girls who I'm sure are going to love being by the water. But I just um, I just felt all these all these thoughts. And then, of course, the Buddha is sitting over it all saying, Vanessa, you know, get out of your judgments. And, and so I was trying hard to do that and say nice things. But I felt then a bit like a, I was being... Um, dishonest in a sense you know so I just wondered if you had any tips on how you deal with that kind of stuff when it comes up because I'm sure I'm not the only person that sometimes goes through these things sorry somebody's giving me the finger <laughs> I mean the thumb the thumb <laughs> not the finger <laughs> Michelle do you want to do you have anything now You're muted there. You're muted. Now something came up on my screen and everything was gone. So here I'm back. And yes, I guess I, I can start. Um, uh, there's a great story of a woman who grew up in Honolulu that um, her uh, grandmother started to get old and needed help and sick. She was in, a, I think, North Dakota or South Dakota. I think it was North Dakota. And um, so she went there to stay with her grandmother for quite a while. And uh, there was a Benedictine monastery <clears throat> fairly close by. And she started visiting there. And this, her grandmother eventually died. And she decided to stay and she wrote a book about um, the Benedictine monastery. And she uh, decided to interview the monks. And one of the questions she asked all the monks was, um, what is your biggest obstacle to God? And she um, waited until the last um, person she interviewed uh, was the oldest monk at this monastery. And so the last person at the monastery, she asked, um, what is your biggest obstacle to God? And he said, oh, the other monks. So that's your bottom line for all of us, right? I mean, it's just, um, you can't control. <laughs> They're so hard to, it's so hard to control yourself, never mind other people. So the bottom line is that humans are pretty uncontrollable and um, it's very unpleasant when, um, in terms of pain, pleasure, neutral, the, the second foundation of mindfulness, unpleasant, pleasant, neutral, um, you can't control that all these thoughts come up and that you have judgment and that it's unpleasant. It's like, first, try to go into your heart and just feel how painful it is. Ouch, it hurts. You know, it's like, um, being able to understand why those thoughts are arising, the aversion to the unpleasantness is happening in your heart. And then usually having to have compassion for yourself first, 
if you're going through a lot is the, is the most important thing. And then accepting that this is happening, accepting that there are plenty of people that are not um, cooperating with the kind of um, standard of trying to protect each other in this time. There are some people who, of course, do go to Florida from the north for like maybe six or eight months that might be and they're old that's very different than a vacation right and so th this kind of whole idea of the vacation uh, at this time especially right now um, I don't I think it would be inevitable that you wouldn't feel uh, that you wish uh, they would be more protective you know, and that, that of course, you know, that so you work with the aversion, you work with the judgment, and then see if you can. Yeah. It was more, it wasn't so much about being able to control them, their feelings were more about that there was such a large part of me that wanted to say, if you want to do that, that's fine, but don't make me part of it. You know, I, I felt I didn't, I didn't want to enable, I felt a bit like an enabler in a way, because if nobody helped them. By looking after the fish and taking in the mail and doing the things we do for right, each other. Right, right, right. Well, I felt, it, I felt it, um, used, used in a way, or whatever the word is, because I mean, I know everybody is different and, I, and they will do it differently, but I don't want to be part of it, you know? That would, I mean, I'm exaggerating. You no, know? no, but I think in some ways you could have said that. Well, I'm, she texted me the day before they were going. And I could have just said, well, sorry, I'm not going to do it. But that would have been a terribly unneighborly thing to do. And I, and I live next door to them, and they're very nice people. You know, we get along well. Yeah, and so, again, it's like, these are all, this is the stuff of life. It's like the quick of life. You can't control. What I meant is you can't control what they did. You mm -hmm. can't control that they asked you. Right? Where, 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 where is the lot? Where is the place of freedom? Where is the place of liberation? And it's, it's around the unpleasant part of it. It's painful. It's painful that they asked. Right? It's painful that you had to feel like, in a way, you felt like you had to say yes. Right? You don't feel like you had that much of a choice. You did. But it's like, and, and then you work with all the get you, it's like the opportunity again to get a relationship with if you, if it's like, this is what happens when I say yes. If you had said no, it would have been, this is what happens when I say no. You would have had just as much stuff to work with if you said no. This is what happens when we say yes. This takes out the whole idea of like whether you say yes or no or whatever, good or bad. It's much more you said yes and then you work with this is what happens when I walk over <laughs> to feed the fish, right? This is what happens when they come back home. It's like a process. It's a moment to moment working with your relationship with what comes up. Maybe you might have been working with guilt or that you didn't do it versus resentment I'm just making it up. I yeah, have no yeah, idea. No. But you know what I mean, that, that there's yeah. a sense that um, accepting that this is what happened, right? It's not right or wrong. It's like, this is what happened. You've done the best you can. And um, the, the purification happens, whether you said yes or no, it would yeah. have been a bummer. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. At least the fish is happy. <laughs> yes. Very important. They yes. are not starving. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> I, I think I would just be careful. The other monks. The other monks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just be careful with the, the notion of non judgment as having anything to do with Buddhism. You know, that. The Buddha didn't talk about non-judgment. You know, if you look at the suttas and he was as discerning as anyone about this is an immoral act or this is a moral action or this is going to have good consequences or not. So that's like a sort of Western kind of overlay, sort of like new agey thing that you'll hear a lot in Buddhist circles. But the Buddha was very 
judgmental in the terms of like discerning right and wrong. So, so to, to say that you feel bad about being judgmental, it's not the issue. I think really like Michelle is saying, it's like the issue is about the aversion and how do you deal with the aversion or the guilt or the shame or the resentment of feeling imposed upon or all of that. And, you know, the answer is always going to be ultimately also that it is about yourself, that, that no matter what conditions, there's going to be these impingements from the outside and that we have responsibility for how we respond to whatever stimuli, whether it's a sense of guilt or shame or feeling, you know, when where do we have a sense of being able to protect our boundaries in a way that's wholesome and healthy and actually taking care of others? Where does it feel like it's disrespectful? Where do we, where is it helpful to learn to be able to disappoint people for the sake of ethical choices? Where is it important to be able to stretch, to be able to support people, you know, who are, you know, in need or whatever it might be. So I, I, yeah, there's not, I don't think a black and white answer, but I do think that, um, you know, you're doing it and it's hard. And I think all kinds of people are experiencing that for sure. You know, and I'll say for myself, it's been very, I've noticed how easy it is to sort of like um, for myself to say, to kind of get into a framework of, well, why can't people just X or Y in terms of letting go of these normal social behaviors that they might, you know, normally do. But I also have not been in a situation in which that's been presented to me much. You know, like I don't live near my family. I don't have a lot of friends here. And so for the first time last month, some friends have actually moved to the island um, with their kids. And so I've seen them once in a while, social distance outside, et cetera, you know, in a park. And, uh, and I see that there are these moments where actually there's, um, the impulse to pick up the kid or like do things that are normal social things and that I just haven't been confronted with those. So it's been easy for me to renounce them, <laughs> except for like in these moments where you're like, oh, I'm actually with people I care about. And there's like a little kid or a fish or whatever. It's like, oh, that, that, that actually makes it more complicated. And you know, that then we have to navigate those waters. So yeah, good luck continuing. Yeah, hopefully they don't ask you to come watch the kids for a few hours or it doesn't grow. <laughs> it um, was not a big example, but it's it's, no. it's a small example of something that is so big. You know? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. For sure. Um, Steven, are you still there? We're around if you, I saw that, let's see. Some people have to. Oh yeah, Stephen Riley, are you still, do you still have a question? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, just have a question kind of about unconditioned mind and I'm not really sure what the question is, but it, it kind of has to do with just like, maybe some terminologists just with Samadhi and unconditioned mind. And then, you know, maybe the, Brahma Viharas are kind of really dropping into the body and how that supports um, unconditioned mind. And um, maybe the obstacle of setting unconditioned mind as a goal in your practice and how that can work as an obstacle. So anything you want to say within that range would be helpful. Thanks. Do you want me to start, Michelle, or do you want to? Yeah. <clears throat> I think it is, I, the terminology is always complicated and, and in terms of tradition and lineage and sort of what these things mean. I mean, I would say on the purest sense in Theravada and Buddhism, if you're talking about mind as any moment of consciousness, like in, in any experience of, of mind, yeah, where there's any moment of consciousness, there is no unconditioned mind. Every moment of consciousness is conditioned. It's conditioned by a past moment of action, of karma, of, of physical or mental action. So, so there's, you know, consciousness arises as a result of impingement upon the sense doors, whether the physical, you know, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or the mind itself. So um, there is Nibbana, which is a non-conditioned, the unconditioned um, as a sort of element of reality but it isn't necessarily it's probably where the language gets confused or not not 
limited is that it's not necessarily um, a, a in the realm of experience um, because because consciousness doesn't even arise in 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 nibbana and in, in the unconditioned. Um, so the idea of cultivating mind and awareness that is less conditioned by certain unwholesome qualities is certainly something that we talk about in terms of the practice, right? Where it's like our response to someone asking us to do something that we feel like is unethical, <laughs> you know, is, is going to be, you know, we're going, it's going to be a conditioned response that the mind has built up, right? A conditioned response to any sense experience we have and so that it's going to be habitual to some degree it's going to be based on past experience it's how we sort of structure the self each of us um and so starting to see that starting to see oh there's this is an unpleasant sensation there's a rejection of it there's a, a hardening of the heart in response to it that's the condition that i notice it's like the more you become familiar with that the more there's understanding and meta and all these things the, the conditions change so that a response of equanimity is then possible, right? It's like, oh, it's just unpleasant or, oh, this is pleasant, but I don't need to grasp toward it. So the, the what qualities of mind are conditioned in terms of the response, the mental response is definitely something that the practice is also oriented towards, right? So that we are helping there be more conditions for there to be an equanimous, caring, compassionate, accepting response to, to phenomena that would otherwise be conditioned towards more aversion or attachment or delusion. Um, and then, yeah, the piece about the loving kindness and the Brahma Viharas in terms of the relationship to the body, in some ways it's, in many ways, it's very related, you know, that there's something about the practice those practices that can start to feel very disembodied, you know, especially if you're kind of just in sort of more concentrated mode with them. Um, and there's something very powerful about when it starts to feel like, oh, there's like a, a sense of abiding physically in these spaces as well. And it's nourishing and it's supportive. And um, so it's, I think it's like exciting when that happens. It's interesting, it's moving. Um, and there is always the question of, discernment at play that's important right because because ultimately loving kindness is a mental quality metta karuna mudita upeka are mental phenomena mental emotional whatever you want to call it and so that the physical kind of response and involvement of pleasant sensations perhaps right that we, was most likely what you would be saying of like oh it's feeling like it's in the body those pleasant sensations can be identified as oh as warmth as tingling as relaxation as whatever but to be careful to identify them in terms of physicality not in terms of mentality because that's where the vipassana piece still comes in is important where we're like the, the we're we're doing both. It's still the discerning mind, the clarity in the, of seeing of the Vipassana is still at play in the practice of loving kindness um, as unified as an experience as it might seem at times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Michelle, you wanna add anything? And your mic is down yep. there, yeah. Um, I think it's, um difficult to appreciate how much striving we have to face in this practice. You know, so that, you know, I often more talk about the line between <clears throat> being with pain and aversion to pain is very thin and often very hard to discern. The line between wanting to be free and, um, setting that goal and then hitching that up to like if you're a modern person the the ambition is merciless it's relentless it's just um uh a true nightmare and, and being able to go ah, ha, 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 striving right you know i was hoping that would be coming up today again right because we hardly even see it so setting that goal of um, the unconditioned versus uh, understanding the conditions with what how even equanimity appears 
we can't make equanimity happen. Um, and, and this is what's so hard. It's like, even when you taste unconditional acceptance, equanimity is genuine, unconditional acceptance of how things are. Even when you taste it, the attachment to it is um, ongoing until full enlightenment, really. I mean, they say maybe third stage, but it's pretty um, intense. So I guess that the difficulty in teaching this is to mention it as a possibility. And of course, um, a deep, the, the peace is, peace and the contentment is the goal of the practice. Ha the happiness of peace and compassion, all of it is the goal of practice. And being able to be with what is happening is really the goal, not somewhere ahead. So that that striving, when you are with it fully, is liberation. You don't get rid of the striving. You get a relationship with it, right? And that's what's so hard to see if equanimity is not present. It's hard to see it. And you keep thinking, if only I'd get rid of it, then I could do it, right? I, if only I could get rid of the doubt, if only I could get rid of the sleepiness, if only I could get rid of my aging body, then I could focus, whatever it is. It's like, it's just endless versus, uh, <laughs> it's that like wisdom of going, oh, wait a minute, if I get, if I'm with this, that's freedom, right? So it's, it's, it's a very good question. I think uh, we have many longer answers to it, but I think that, um, and man, without the Brahma Viharas, there's no way. <laughs> no there isn't yeah totally not for i don't i mean maybe one and one on the planet can pull it off or two but generally speaking again we're in a modern world where the heart is a pretty dried up and without the brahma viharas there's no juice yeah. it's striving mm -hmm. that's my short answer <laughs> thank you guys thank you. yeah I, I just want to say one thing i mean i think <laughs> yeah. it's that like you know, Stevens, in Stevens' talk last week, and I asked him later if he would do a more of an elaboration on this at some point for folks, because it's so important of like, you know, talking about resolves, right? That it's part of a big part of his training and it's a big, in certain parts of the lineage of like, you'll you'll be sitting or walking and you take you, this idea of taking resolve like okay for for this next five steps i'm going to try to be very mindful you know or for this sitting i'm really going to try to not move and this idea of like taking resolves that you actually have maybe a chance of succeeding in you know and and the and the strength of that of like oh if you make a resolve that's like feasible that you actually could pull off that actually can can cut a groove and, and dig a channel, the, but that you're not making resolves for things that are like so unrealistic for like whatever the next five steps are, that you're careful with the process, you know, and that there's a lot more to it, but I think it's very interesting. And then there's, and, and, and it can be a part of our training. On the other hand, I told the story at some point recently of, I can't remember, still don't remember who it was of a, recently of a, a colleague, somebody it was uh, asking a, a kind of more revered, monastic about whether they should incline the mind toward nibbana or towards the unconditioned in their practice and the, and the monk was very clear he's like your mind will get the object it deserves no. <laughs> you know <laughs> it's just like no and it's just like what michelle's saying it's like you're trying to get something you're trying there's there's some motivation there always that's going to be unclean right or that's not maybe that that can be a loaded language but like that's not just accepting there's a wanting and as long as there's wanting you're not going to have peace and so it's like trying to get peace through wanting is like a setup and it's like no you get the object you deserve moment to moment to moment to moment <laughs> and like that's what you show up for and that's the practice you know so it is a great question yeah. uh, thank you mm -hmm. so much <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, wonderful to be with everyone again this week. Mm. All these time zones. I just found out there's no time zone at the North Pole. Huh. Think about that. Does that mean 
That's Santa your call has, on for the Santa week. has to work 24 <laughs> seven. Does that mean that? <laughs> <laughs> or he doesn't work at all. There's, That's you know. better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Take care, folks. Feel free to write goodbye or whatever in the chat or uh, I think um, I'll make sure if people can unmute themselves if you'd like to, to say goodbye. And um, yeah, we'll see you next week. Aloha. Good night. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. Thank you.